Hello viewers, welcome to this series, Compelling Reason. I'm Lizzie from Reasonable Faith UK. With me is Paul Lyndon Burtwell, an apologist and TV presenter, also for Reasonable Faith. Hello, Paul. Hi, Lizzie. How are you doing? Awesome. Pretty pumped about today's episode. Good. So, um, in this series, we want to explore the latest science, maths and philosophy that would lead a reasonable person to a logical conclusion about the existence of God. But first, it's worth mentioning that millions of people over thousands of years have stated God exists because of a personal encounter with him. Yeah, the greatest evidence for the existence of God is that personal encounter. It's the revelation of the Holy Spirit um, revealing Christ to our hearts and lives. And there really <laughs> isn't any bigger evidence than that. And I know for me personally, I was raised in a, a non-Christian, a non-religious household. My parents, it's not that they were kind of against God or, or even didn't believe in God. It's that God didn't factor in our lives at all. We didn't ever go to church unless it was a wedding or a funeral. And even then I can count on one hand how many times I actually went to church. Um, so God just was not on our radar at all. All I was interested in was playing sports with my friends, pretty girls and uh, committing a bit of crime here and there. So, you know, that's kind of, that was my life. And it wasn't until the age of 16 that I was out on the football pitch playing football with my friends, kicking the ball around. And I can remember looking up at the night sky and, and seeing all the stars that were up there. And it dawned on me, well, the question, the philosophical question dawned on me, where did all of this come from? I'd studied physics and science at school. So I understood the theory of the Big Bang that the whole universe came into being a finite time ago. But then I began to question, well, if the universe began to exist, what caused the universe to begin to exist? And as I really thought about that question, I was really left with two options. Either nothing caused the universe to come into existence, which is nonsense, logical nonsense, or something outside of the universe caused the universe to come into being. And really from that point onwards, I began to pursue um, knowledge of God. And I came to the realization that number one, God does exist. And, and Jesus Christ is his son, is his Messiah. And that he died on the cross for our sins and rose again on the third day. And when I had that personal encounter with Jesus, I moved from the realm of knowing in my mind that God must exist to knowing in my heart that God is a reality. So that was, that's my journey. What about you, Lizzie? Yeah, so I um, had a different experience, but arrived at the same point. So I grew up in a Christian home. Um, like my family for generations had been Christians. In fact, they arrived in Australia from Prussia to escape persecution for being Christian. So it was my heritage, it was cultural, it was my family. And, um, but then as a teenager, I actually arrived at a point where I was like, why do I believe this? Is it because it's what my parents told me? Is it because it's the environment I'm in? It's the school, is it indoctrination? Like I needed to know for myself, is this real? And so as a teenager, I distinctly recall going to the toilets at school. I think, you know, I was going through the angst most female teenagers go through. And so I was kind of unhappy with my life. And I remember sitting on the toilet and saying, God, if you are real, I need you to show me that you exist because I feel like right now I believe in you because it's just how I've been raised. And I feel like over that next year, I had very specific um, encounters where um, God really made himself real to me. It was undeniable. I experienced his presence, his love, um, healing in my heart. Um, I would pray about things and then people would come and speak to me and they would not have known what I had prayed. And I'm like, okay, there must be a God because there's no way they could have known that. And then they've come and done this in my life. So for me, it became a personal experience. I hadn't yet even explored all of the science and the math and the philosophy, but that personal encounter was enough for me. But now i am so enjoyed meeting you and I'm on this journey of, I, I want to understand what's out there in the universe. And as um, humans have evolved and we, we understand more about the world we live in, what now supports this very personal and real experience that I've had. So let's talk about this. <laughs> In terms of um, a lot of, the, I think the argument comes up that, well, it's just always been here. 
there is no need for a God. Um, so what would you say to that? What science is now out there that kind of makes that thinking illogical? Yeah, I mean, it really is nowadays the overwhelming um, conclusion of, I think you mentioned at the beginning, science, mathematics and philosophy. When you put these three disciplines together, it really does point to the existence of God. The cumulative case for the existence of God from these disciplines is enormous. And as Christians, we should never be afraid of true science because true science will always lead us back to the creator. Mm -hmm. uh, there are scientific theories that have some support or other theories have no support, but then there are those theories that have an overwhelming support of evidence from um, observations. And one of those things is actually the beginning of the universe. Science calls it the Big Bang Theory. Um, but what the Big Bang really is, is the sudden appearance of the universe. Uh, and by universe, we mean space, time, uh, matter, energy. Mm -hmm. It suddenly appeared. And contrary to popular opinion, it wasn't a huge explosion in space. That, that didn't happen. It was a massive inflation. So if you think of a balloon, maybe at a birthday party, you're blowing up a balloon. It starts very, very small to begin with. But as you push air into it, it expands and inflates. And if you were to imagine sticking some, gluing some buttons onto the surface of the rubber of the balloon, and as you're blowing that balloon up, those buttons are moving apart and away from each other. Mm -hmm. That's what the Big Bang was. It was a sudden inflation or expansion of space, time, matter, and energy. And those little buttons on the surface are like uh, uh, globs of matter that turned into universes or planets or stars. And we can still see it today through telescopes that the universe is still growing, it's still inflating, it's still expanding. But then that begs the question, if the universe is expanding, if we were to press rewind on the history of the universe, we would see it deflating, coming back onto itself all the way down to a singular point mm -hmm. prior to which the universe didn't exist. And when we study the Holy Bible, when we study Genesis, when we study the book of Job, we look at the, the prophets and the Psalms and the writer of the book of Hebrews, they all agree on how the universe came into being, i.e. Uh, a beginning of space, time and matter, mm -hmm. um, constant laws of physics, uh, uh, a pervasive law of entropy. And what the Bible describes thousands of years ago is what modern day science calls the Big Bang. So I think the Big Bang Theory is one of the strongest evidences for the existence of God that we have as believers today. That was such a fantastic explanation because you're right, like growing up in school, I believed the Big Bang Theory was just this kaboom. And as a Christian, I was like, well, how does God fit into that? If there's the creation of the world and this very definite beginning, um, this idea of the Big Bang to me was contradicting that we believe that God created the universe. So the how, how would you tie in this idea of the seven day creation story in Genesis with this idea of the Big Bang? Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I want to come back to, first of all, to the name of the Big Bang, if that's okay, okay before we sure, look at Genesis. Yeah. And the Big Bang was a term coined by Sir Fred Hoyle. Mm -hmm. And he really did not like the Big Bang theory when it was discovered because he said in his own words, it looks way too much like the book of Genesis. And because he didn't believe in God himself, and he it's wasn't- It's a problem for an atheist. <laughs> it's a big problem for an atheist. And so on a BBC radio interview, he coined it the Big Bang. He said there was this explosion at the beginning of the year. And since then it stuck, but it was a derisive term. It wasn't a, oh. a term of endearment for the theory. He was actually against the theory. And uh, he kind of held to a steady state theory that the universe has always been here. And so he didn't like, Einstein didn't like the Big Bang Theory. He wanted it to be a steady state universe. But as time went on and more and more evidence came to the fore, it's very clear now that the universe did have a beginning a finite time ago. And since then it's been expanding. And when we come back to the book of Genesis, what's the opening verse in Genesis? In the beginning, time. God created, and the word created there is bara in Hebrew. It means creating a special act of creation. God created the heavens, hashamayim in Hebrew. It means space and all that's within space, all of the stars and galaxies and, and planets. 
and the earth, Ha'eretz, which is what we live on, but it's also uh, the word for matter, for substance. So in the beginning, uh, we have time. God created space and matter. And the opening verse of the book of Genesis actually predicts the Big Bang theory. And so the Big Bang is terrific confirmation for the existence of the God of the Holy Bible. So since meeting you, I've become aware of other science that supports what we're talking about, a very definite beginning and the universe expanding, um, the law of thermodynamics, law of entropy. Could you explain that? Sure. So when we look at the universe, one of the reasons why we know the universe is not infinite into the past or eternal into the past is because stars are still shining. And if the universe had been here forever, the energy contained within those stars would have burnt out by now. There would be no stars, there would be no planets. Um, and science confirms that. So 100%. they now have, where they've seen it, they've got evidence that the energy is running out. Yeah, and we can look through telescopes into space and we can literally see stars that have burnt out right. and galaxies that are on their way out. And that's what black holes are. Black holes are where uh, huge stars have imploded on themselves. So. We know these things have existed in the past. They had a, a lifespan and then they've died out. But the fact that we can still see light from distant galaxies and light from stars and even light being reflected off of planets reveals to us that the universe is not infinitely old because if there's still usable energy out there in space, then the universe must be reasonably young mm -hmm. in order to be burning that energy so that we can still see it today. So really, in terms of this age-old question, does God exist, that discovery by Hubble was pretty significant in the science community, wasn't it, when he discovered uh, he could see the red light from a distance? Yeah, because what, what happens with space, as space stretches out, so the wavelength of light stretches into the red spectrum, mm -hmm. it shifts, that's why it's called red shift, and so the further out into space we look, the redder the, the light coming to us is. So the galaxies further out in space are redder than the ones closer to us, which tells us that space is stretching. And if space once again is stretching and expanding and inflating, then you've got yourself a Big Bang cosmology. Then you've got confirmation that the Bible is true. So the Big Bang is a friend to Christians. And, you know, what I find a real shame is when I talk to other Christians about the Big Bang Theory, they're, they're against it. And you say, well, why are you against the Big Bang Theory? And they don't know why. It's, they're against it because other people have told them to be against well, I it. I think it comes back to what we were talking about. Like, even as a young person, I was under this impression there was this explosion and that that then removed the possibility that God started it all, that it just kind of was like, something going kaboom. And yeah, that that's big bang, that term is very misleading. I've even heard Christian, let's sort of creationists mm -hmm. say this, that yeah. have you ever seen an explosion from which order comes? And of course, no, you, you know, explosions do not create yeah. order. Of course Law of they entropy. Don't. Yeah. Things break um, down over time. But the Big Bang was an explosion. It was an inflation of space and time and energy and matter. Mm. And as it as it expanded and as the universe cooled down, the the, 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 the forces of nature, the, the, the law of gravity began to work upon this energy and matter and began to pull it together and to condense it into stars and into planets. And so we see the invisible hand of God operating in the universe, creating these galaxies, creating these stars and planets. And what's really exciting, we don't have to guess as to how God did this. We can literally look into a telescope, look back in time Incredible. as we look further back into the universe, like with the James uh, Webb Space Telescope. We can look to the farthest reaches of, of, of the universe back uh, many, many eons of time and actually see God creating the universe from nothing. This is a little bit of a segue, but I've got to say, it's such a shame that this is not taught in our schools. You know, they don't talk about this kind of science in a very neutral state in terms of, well, what's the conclusion you arrive at? There is the possibility that God exists. Segway over. <laughs> so I would like to say, so go. Yeah, I was just going to say, well, that's the difference between science and philosophy. Philosophy, what well, science explains what's happening. Mm -hmm. Philosophy asks the question, why? Yeah, how do we how? explain what we're seeing? Yeah. yeah. So a scientist will never, you know, a scientist will never turn around and say science proves God because science cannot prove God. It, it generally can't prove much. It just tells us mm -hmm. how the universe is. Yeah. 
Um, but if really you, good. Yeah, if you've got an expanding universe, then philosophy then steps in and says, well, why is it expanding? Mm -hmm. What caused it to expand? Has it been expanding forever? Is that even possible? Uh, and what is the cause of the expanding universe? So, Paul, the universe expanding and energy running out are two pretty important, pretty rock solid scientific evidences for a very definite beginning. Absolutely. Yeah. I love this quote from cosmologist Alexander Vilenkin, who was one of the three scientists who proved the universe had a definite beginning. And he says, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. And it is a problem. <laughs> it's a real problem for atheists because if the universe has a beginning, then that leads us on to a great philosophical argument called the Kalam cosmological argument. And explain. with all <laughs> explain with all really good arguments, you have premises and you have a conclusion. And if the premises of an argument are sound, then the conclusion naturally follows. Mm -hmm. And so, premise one of the argument is everything that begins to exist has a cause. Premise two: the universe began to exist. And if those two premises are true, and if they're sound, then the conclusion naturally follows. And that is, therefore, the universe has a cause. And if the universe has a cause, which is what the argument points to, then the cause of the universe exists outside of the universe. Of course, the universe couldn't create itself, just like you couldn't create you and I couldn't create me. We needed parents to create us. And so the universe also needs a parent or a creator to bring it into existence. And so that strongly suggests the existence of God. Well, it's a bit of a problem for atheists like Richard Dawkins that would say when challenged with, well, how did it all get here? And I think one of his comments, he's quoted as saying it was a special kind of nothing. What might be the problem with the idea <laughs> that nothing created everything? Yeah, it was, it was during one of his his television interviews, um, somebody challenged him on the cause of the universe. And he said, well, I believe that literally nothing created the universe. And then when the audience laughed at that, because they could pick up on the, the, the nonsensical answer he was giving, yeah. he says, ah, but it was a very special kind of nothing. And of course, the moment you add any sort of property to nothing, it becomes something. Mm -hmm. And so Richard Dawkins really was arguing that something caused the universe, which once again brings us back to the existence of God. Um, when we look at nothing, it it is literally no thing. Mm -hmm. From no thing, nothing comes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's because nothing lacks all properties, including power, mm -hmm. potential, and possibility. And where you don't have any possibility and where you don't have any potential for a universe to arise, of course, a universe will not arise. And so Richard Dawkins comment was nonsensical it's illogical I I'm, I sorry were you gonna say more I love the audience response and this comes back to at the very beginning of this episode we just said that when you put the science the math the philosophy what humans have discovered about the universe out there a reasonable logical person will arrive at a certain conclusion that it does point to a definite beginning and to a creator because the audience laughed. It just sounded so illogical to say nothing, even a special kind of nothing created everything. Yeah, 100%. And I'm fully convinced. I mean, with apologetics, sometimes people can get the wrong idea that we're trying to convince people that God exists. I don't believe that. Romans chapter 1 tells us that God has given his general revelation to all of humanity and that they are without excuse and that we have on the inside of us a, a knowledge of his existence. But what we do through our sin is that we put up barriers against the knowledge of God. We set up arguments or strongholds against the knowledge of God. And what apologetics does is not try and convince somebody that God exists. We tear down the opposing arguments of the atheist. We show that these arguments that they that they kind of hide behind mm -hmm. are nonsensical arguments. And once you tear those down, they're kind of left naked, they're left bare. Mm -hmm. 
And so they're far more than receptive to receiving the gospel message. Once all of these opposing arguments have been demolished, these strongholds have been torn down, then it's far more likely for the gospel to, to penetrate the heart. Can I just read that passage from Romans 12? Please. So Romans 12, 20, it says, Since the creation of the world, there it is, had a definite beginning, was created, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So right there, it's talking about it's visible. So if if we're willing to be open about this and we're willing to look at what's out there in nature and in the universe and actually ask a few questions like, well, how did this get here? Why are we here? Um, we will arrive at a conclusion. Yeah, and when you boil all of the arguments down to its simplest form, mm -hmm. you've got one of two options. Either nothing created everything or something eternal created everything everything it really you can really boil all of the amazing 20 plus arguments for the existence of god when you boil them all down mm -hmm. it comes down to either something created everything or nothing did make your choice it's a bit of a for maybe somebody that's never even wanted to think about it and why do you think that is is it because if we own to or we arrive at the conclusion there is a god then it opens up a plethora of other things that we then need to either answer or act upon within our own lives? Do you think perhaps it's a little bit of stick my head in the sand because I'd rather not like yes. deal with this idea that God's there? Yeah, people become morally accountable the moment God exists. Yeah. And when we look back to the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, the moment they sinned against God and they heard God walking in the garden, what did they do? They went and hid. They put a barrier between themselves and God because mm -hmm. they, they didn't want to see him they didn't want to feel naked and exposed before him. And that's what people do. People, I, I've never met anyone who truly denies the existence of God with their intellect. It's always emotional. Yeah. It's always something they feel. Maybe they've been hurt. Maybe they prayed a prayer that wasn't answered. Maybe, maybe they've undergone abuse. Um, or maybe they just love their sin. And they don't want to give up maybe, I don't know, sleeping around or getting drunk or partying. They don't want to give these things up. They don't want to be morally accountable to somebody. So they erect these strongholds. They erect these arguments. And really, that is the job of the apologist. It's to tear these arguments down, to demolish every argument that sets itself up against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And see, it's really interesting because I think if we're really honest with ourselves, like I think about small children I remember myself when you've done something wrong it's like you instinctively know and you kind of want to hide the data from your parents because you don't want to then face the consequence so I think if we really are willing to be open-minded about what's out there and listen to the arguments but we're also willing to be honest within ourselves as to why we're holding up this argument because like you said when we look at the arguments and it all boils down we're, we're left laid bare and we kind of need to reach a decision point ourselves, don't we? Yeah, and the amazing thing about God is that he knows that we're sinners. And, you know, God doesn't come to condemn us for our sin. He comes to save us from it. And so, yes, there will be things when we repent and trust in Jesus that we have to give up. There is still moral accountability. There is a standard by which we should live as followers of Jesus. But what you gain in return is infinitely more uh, pleasurable, joyful, exciting, uh, hope inspiring than what you had before. So it really is the best decision that you could make as a human being. So if you found today intriguing and you're open to hearing more evidence um, that would lead you to your own conclusion, then why not follow us? You can check us out on our website, godofhopetour.com. Um, we also, if you subscribe through that website, we have a question of the week. It's an apologetics type question. And you're also very welcome to email us through that website, your question. We'd love to hear from you. And just to kind of sum up today's talk, we've got this amazing short film we're going to show now just for our viewers to watch. Does God exist? 
Or is the material universe all that is, or ever was, or ever will be? One approach to answering this question is the cosmological argument. It goes like this. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Is the first premise true? Let's consider. Believing that something can pop into existence without a cause is more of a stretch than believing in magic. At least with magic you've got a hat and a magician. And if something can come into being from nothing, then why don't we see this happening all the time? No, everyday experience and scientific evidence confirm our first premise. If something begins to exist, it must have a cause. But what about our second premise? Did the universe begin? Or has it always existed? Atheists have typically said that the universe has been here forever. The universe is just there, and that's all. First, let's consider the second law of thermodynamics. It tells us the universe is slowly running out of usable energy. And that's the point. If the universe had been here forever, it would have run out of usable energy by now. The second law points us to a universe that has a definite beginning. This is further confirmed by a series of remarkable scientific discoveries. In 1915, Albert Einstein presented his general theory of relativity. This allowed us, for the first time, to talk meaningfully about the past history of the universe. Next, Alexander Friedman and George Lemaitre, each working with Einstein's equations, predicted that the universe is expanding. Then in 1929, Edwin Hubble measured the red shift in light from distant galaxies. This empirical evidence confirmed not only that the universe is expanding, but that it sprang into being from a single point in the finite past. It was a monumental discovery, almost beyond comprehension. However, not everyone is fond of a finite universe, so it wasn't long before alternative models popped into existence. But one by one, these models failed to stand the test of time. More recently, three leading cosmologists Arvin Bord, Alan Guth and Alexander Vilenkin prove that any universe which has on average been expanding throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past but must have an absolute beginning. This even applies to the multiverse, if there is such a thing. This means that scientists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Any adequate model must have a beginning just like the standard model. It's quite plausible then that both premises of the argument are true. This means that the conclusion is also true. The universe has a cause. And since the universe can't cause itself, its cause must be beyond the space-time universe. It must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused and unimaginably powerful. Much like God. The cosmological argument shows that, in fact, it is quite reasonable to believe that God does exist.